After Love by Sarah Teasdale. There is no magic anymore. We meet as other people do. You work no miracle for me, nor I for you. You are the wind and I the sea. There is no splendor anymore. I have grown listless as the pool beside the shore. But though the pool is safe from storm and from the tide has found surcease, it grows more bitter than the sea for all its peace. For all its peace. That's the closest we'll be getting to serious today. On with the bullshittery. Hey guys, it's Flower Gothic and welcome to the new set and my annual Flower Shits on the Monarchy video. Yay! This time though, I'm gonna do something different. Watch a piece of media based on the life of a royal. Y'all know what you're in for, it's in the fucking title. I am going to discuss Broadway's shitty musical about Diana, Princess of Wales. Diana needs no introduction. She was the daughter of an earl that became Britain's crown princess in 1981 through what can best be described as an arranged marriage. She got famous, her husband resented her and cheated on her, they got divorced. She died tragically at 36 in 1997. People still adore Diana today because she showed something many royals at the time didn't. Vulnerability. She openly discussed the shit she had to put up with and people resonated with her. And to this day, there are books, movies, and so on about Diana, as well as this fucking musical. So let's dissect Diana the Musical for what it stands for. But first, my disclaimers. One. I will be ignoring historical accuracy, mostly because A, I don't care, and B, that's not the point of this video. I want to discuss how Diana fails as a musical and a narrative instead. Two, do not harass anyone I mention, do not dogpile, etc. Three, this is technically an opinion piece. If you disagree with me, fine comments antagonizing me or others will be blocked. Please behave yourselves. Now, on with the show! So the musical is problemed from the very start, especially with its first song, Underestimated. I don't know if I've told you all this before, but I have a lot of experience in lyric writing. I haven't done it in a long time, but I remember enough to know what makes a good song and what doesn't. The Diana songs are pretty, but basic. There's no value in listening to them on their own. This reads like something I would write at 17. It's a very rudimentary song that only serves to further a narrative. For a comparison, here's a song I wrote when I was 17 or 18. I never thought I could love again since she treated me like a shoe. I wanted to turn my heart off, but soon enough, I had met you. Your eyes sparkle like diamonds, and you're what I've wanted and more. But can I fall in love again, or have I closed my heart's door? Dull, isn't it? Underestimated also doesn't work as an opening song. When you're starting a play or a musical or the like, you want to introduce the audience to the world and the everyday life of its main character, the quote-unquote 
ordinary world of the hero's journey. For example, while writing this video, my brother was working tech for his school's production of Chicago. The opening song of Chicago, All That Jazz, sets up the main characters, the tone of the show, and what to expect later on. It introduces Velma, a vaudeville star accused of killing her husband, and Roxy, a woman who kills her lover. Both have laissez-faire attitudes and show no remorse for their actions. They may be shitty people, but you can't help but admire their gusto. Here, we have no reason to relate to Diana. She's not an every person, nor is she Velma or Roxy. She's literally singing about how she's been underestimated her whole life and she doesn't know what to do. Granted, such a song might work for a different character, but since most people know who Diana is, it just feels off. Especially when Camilla appears and acts friendly to her. His Royal Highness was wondering where you went. He sent me to find you. I just needed a little air. <laughs> it's such a posh party. Mm. I'm used to talking to five-year-olds. So oh. not my scene. Well, His Royal Highness is certainly glad you came. I can tell he's taken quite a liking to you. Has he really? When you come back in, I'll make sure you do have some time alone. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, Mrs. Parker Bowles, but call me Camilla. Charles and I are old chums. Camilla's two-faced behavior is another thing that could have worked if we didn't know that she was having an affair with Charles, which I'm sure the target audience is well aware of. Side note. I'm well aware that Gianna Dewell won a Razzie for her portrayal of Diana. I'll avoid my feelings towards the Razzies being shit in general, but Dewell wasn't bad. She's doing her best with the material she's been given. It's not the best performance by a Broadway actress, but she's certainly trying and I appreciate her for that. Hell, I can say that for all the talent. Sure, Charles looks like Andy Samberg, but he's trying to seem like Charles. And Judy Kay as Elizabeth and Barbara Cartland is the highlight of the show, no matter what the Razzies say. She's a Broadway veteran, and her versatility in these vastly different characters shines here. Doesn't she understand by now we don't speak to the press? She understands next to nothing. Oh, doesn't she? she Darling Diana! Barbara Cartland, oh, just look at you! I know, I'm delicious. My only complaint is that Barbara is a useless character that drags the show, but at least she's the fun kind of useless. The next song, The Worst Job in England, does serve its purpose, but boringly so. It makes Charles pressure Diana more as he's being pressured to get hitched. A future queen should have no past. Find a Charles and find a fox. The problem here is the same with Underestimated. This is nothing new if you're familiar with the source material, and it's very banal and not worth a listen on its own. Then the rest of the musical is spoiled. How could she not? She'll be Britain's heart. From time to time, she'll be torn apart. She'll have a star all her own. And not another moment alone. Fucking hell, how did this pass the workshop phase? The scene following, however, is the first one I kind of like. Diana is talking with her sister, Sarah, about Charles, and it's clear they have a loving sisterly relationship. It's a shame they have so few scenes together. My only complaint is the virgin shaming. And against all odds, you're still a virgin. I'm not a virgin, and even I'm offended. This segues into one of the musical's most infamous scenes, where through sheer pop culture references, they try Try and paint an aristocrat as someone who is among the common folk. But before we continue, we must discuss the central problem of the musical. It's not the terribly written songs, it's not the average acting, it's that we already know the story of Diana and making it into a musical adds nothing to it. The target audience and even those out of it 
know that Diana arranged to marry Charles. He cheated on her with Camilla. Diana became very popular. Then she got divorced and died. And the musical is a bare bones retelling of it. The same year Diana premiered on Broadway, the film Spencer, a retelling of Diana's decision to separate from Charles, was released to glowing reviews. Spencer works because it's a tragic, thought provoking retelling of Diana's marriage that utilizes her weakening mental state to paint how her deteriorating marriage is affecting her. It's a unique interpretation of the story. Diana the Musical is not. This is not to say a musical based on historical people and events can't work. It just needs to have appeal beyond event, but with singing. Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson is an alternative rock retelling of Andrew Jackson's presidency. Six is a retelling of the lives of Henry VIII's six wives that utilizes all six of them as a pop group. Diana adds nothing new to the table. Okay, rant over. Let's sink my teeth into this scene. The point of this is how your people dance is spoiled by Charles and Camilla's conversation. They laugh about how young and pop culture obsessed Diana is. Before we get to the song that shows how young and pop culture obsessed Diana is. Soak it in, feel the strings, hear the sound of angels' wings. How I wish that he were Elton John. Then again, don't create a scene. You're auditioning to be his queen. Charles and Camilla are obviously painted as the bad guys here, which isn't an ideal thing to do when creating characters based on morally gray humans. So, this song. It highlights yet another problem with the musical. The number is supposed to show Charles and the Royals as uptight and up their ass, and Diana as the ooh ooh commoner people's princess. And yes, Diana did like 80s pop culture. But this is the only time this shit is brought up. Me thinks it was only to try and paint Diana as a relatable person, which is unnecessary. The target audience already likes her and everyone else is gonna call you out on your bluff. The choreography is very awkward too. It's like how people imagine white people dance. I mean, it's true, but this is a Broadway performance. Isn't trained dancing one of those requirements for Broadway? Also, it's clear Diana and Charles aren't comfortable with the dancing they're doing. Then Camilla has a solo, and it's clear she isn't the best singer. She's trying to sing through her accent instead of with it. Then we get our mandatory paparazzi bad scene. It's ironic because they're exploiting Diana fans through this musical. Most of my notes for the remainder of act one were along the lines of, there is no point to this scene except to reiterate what the target audience already knows. There were pages and pages of this. Like, I don't need to tell y'all that royals don't tend to marry for love. We know that. I don't need to tell y'all how quickly Diana was embraced by the public. We know that. I could talk about the stereotypical camp gay butler, but who the fuck cares? Act one drags and it drags bad. After the wedding scene, there were nine songs remaining. I summarized them all. There's nothing new to the table. Diana has her sons. She engages in self-harm. She's encouraged to be herself and she grows more popular. Charles and Camilla continue to resent her. It's not so bad, it's good bad, it's dull bad. And talking about it anymore will make me sound like a broken record. So I'll wrap this up with the musical's final problem. It's narrative. Diana was a very complicated person. Hell, most people are complicated. But the way this musical chooses to show all the aspects of her life seems sloppy. Musicals can have multiple plots. That isn't the problem. But the problem is that the musical seems to think that everything Diana related is one plot, while everything Charles related is another. Which is not how subplots work. At the Smash Broadway hit The Pajama Game, there are a number of plots it juggles well. 
the developing affair between Superintendent Sid and Labor Leader Babe, the relationship problems of Timekeeper Himes and Secretary Gladys, and the threat of a union strike. The couple's stories are balanced relatively well, and it doesn't lose focus of the underlying plot that unions are good and that anyone who says otherwise should be sent to the guillotine. <laughs> Here, the plots aren't balanced. They try to treat every aspect of Diana's life equally, when it shouldn't. As a result, the scenes of Diana's life that were monumental read as jokes and nothing compared to their marital troubles. And the tone is inconsistent as well. Are we supposed to cry, laugh, live, love? I don't know. Anyway, Diana gets a divorce and dies. The end. This was not a fun video to make. My friend introduced me to this musical and I initially saw it as one of those things I could laugh at while drinking. But overall, it's boring. It's not even worth an ironic watch. While writing this video, I kept having to stop because I lost the will to keep on going. Don't give this any more views. It deserves to be forgotten lost to the pits of time, becoming nothing but dust in the wind. That's the show. Good night and goodbye.